Welcome to the Photo Flunky Show, episode 138. On today's episode, we're going to talk about our experiences with silhouette portrait photography. Hi, my name is William Beam. Hi, my name is Lee Beam. And welcome to the Photo Flunky Show. We help photographers become better visual storytellers so they can take better photos to share, sell, and remember. All right, so if you're wondering what we're talking about with silhouette portrait photography, basically these are portraits where you're not lighting your subject, you're lighting the background. And all you really need to do is find a nice clean background. And in our case, we use some gels, uh, particularly I use some magma gels. I'll put links to that in the show notes. And just kind of give you an idea of what we found of what works and what didn't. And we also kind of want to share with you some of the problems that came up when we were shooting you know, our silhouette portraits. And, but really it was, it was just kind of a, a creative idea. And the reason why I wanted to do this in the first place is because Lee is, as I've mentioned before, she's really into her fitness and she's rocking some big muscles on her arms these days. <laughs> and, and I don't mean huge, like, you know, she's not looking like, Arnold Schwarzenegger at the I'm beginning of his time, but she has some really well-defined musculature and her body fat is down, what, 12%? 11. 11. 11% now. Man, you just keep going down. <laughs> I think the best, when I was doing workouts, I think the best I ever got to was 12%. So you've already surpassed me. <laughs> and and the difference, you know, between a man's body fat and a woman's body fat, you know, women typically have more just, you know, by nature than men do. Yeah, but... The thing is to see the muscles, that's actually where the key is. You can build them, but if you really want to see the definition, that's what you have to do. And that's what we wanted to do is we wanted to find what is a creative way to show the definition that you've, you've achieved. And there are different ways that you can light this and play with shadows. And I thought, you know what, let's just eliminate all the light on you and just see the outline that you had. And then this wasn't, you know, this was just like what your, your gym attire so, yeah, I just had shorts and a like a sports bra, or sports something. bra, or something on. Yeah, but we were kind of wondering, you know, what would this happen? What would this look like? We didn't really know. We had some guesswork, but it was something just kind of fun that we set up a little small home studio. I put up a roll of seamless gray paper. It was just what uh, fashion gray from Savage, in case you're wondering. But what we wanted to do was share a little bit of why we did this and what uh, our concept was. And, and actually the concept was not just the silhouette, but also to play with color and light. Yes. And that's where the gels came in. I, I started off with a couple of different colors. We found some colors that we liked. We found some that we thought we would like, but they really didn't work very well. And some that just looked like they'd work well together and who really didn't. Yeah. So we started off, I think, was it like um, a purple and uh, either a cyan or a kind of a light blue. Something like that, yeah. And I put, you know, one flash on one side and one flash on the other side. I was using my uh, Flashpoint Evolve 200s, or if you've got uh, Godox, they're AD 200. Same light. It's just, you know, a different brand name on them. But you can do this with any flash. So long as you can put a gel over it, the gels that I use, as I said, were MagMod. And you can get the basic kit, and it'll come with some color correction gels. But they also have both an artistic gel kit and a creative gel kit. You don't have to use those. You can get, you know, the usual flimsy gels. The What's reason, the difference between artistic and creative? I think labeling. Oh, I, <laughs> I, mean, I was curious. I, I don't know anything about this, but so I'm, you know. I think that's just marketing labeling because they are a different color pack. And All so right. the colors were different between each one of them. When you say creative or artistic, I have no idea. I think it's just, a, you know, so they could sell a different gel pack with a... A name. different name. Okay. Yeah. It, I, they could have gone artistic one and artistic two, or they could have gone artistic and creative. I have no idea why they chose the names that they did. The reason that I like the magma gels is because they are not flimsy gels that you typically see that you have to tape on or put a rubber band around your flash or anything like that. They're polycarbonate. They're rigid and they're easily stackable. You can put more gels together. I, I didn't really want to do that, but I... I've got, you know, the little MagMod wallet. So I've got a nice collection of gels that I don't have to worry about getting wrinkled or how I store them. They're, they're solid gels that I can use over and over and over again. And they work very well. So the MagMod kit is something where you just put a, a strong, sturdy rubber band over the front of your flash head. And it's got these two very powerful magnets on either side. 
And then all the accessories have magnets in them too. And they just pop right on there. We didn't have any problem. There's no tape. There's no Velcro. There's none of that flimsy stuff. It was a really... Yeah, it was con- really easy. It's- it was convenient and easy. And I got two kits, you know, one for each flash. So that way we'd just pop in the gel colors that we wanted and went from there. So we started off, as I said, I think with purple and a cyan color. Mm-hmm. And honestly, I think that was my favorite. Yep, that worked well. I just picked colors I liked. I had no idea what to do. I've never even watched anyone doing silhouette photography, so I, did, I didn't have a clue. The One of the things that we were working with is trying to make sure that we understood exactly where to put the flash and how much power to put in the flash to get the color the way that we wanted. The higher your flash goes, the more white light comes out and the more faded your, your color gel is. So you mm-hmm. don't necessarily want to put in too much power into the flash in order to make this look right. Yeah, because you lose some color concentration. One of the other things we found is if you want to have a broader beam on your background, you pull your flash away from it, and that way you get, instead of just having like a little cone that uh, spreads out, you know, like a radial, radial gradient, you pull your flash back and it covers much more. The problem we had is this was in our house. There was only so far we could pull back. Yeah, that's true. You know, we, we have... Uh, we have a nice living room with a tall ceiling in it, so we, we can set up our background in there. But pulling the flash back, you don't want it to be in, you don't want it to shine on your subject. At least we didn't want it for this one. We wanted a, a silhouette. Mm-hmm. So that meant that we had to kind of pull it onto the sides, maybe at a 45 degree angle. On one side, we actually have plenty of room. On the other side, not we, so much. Not so much because there's a hallway and there's a wall there, and it's like it only the fireplace goes so far. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we were limited by our space. And something we, we could have done, but we didn't do is maybe had put one of them on the floor and just kind of shot straight up, you know, behind you. Mm. But we were also doing some full length. So putting a stand behind you didn't really work for no, what, what we wanted to there. do. We wanted to do some full length stuff. So we were kind of limited by the space that we had. But overall, we were really having a lot of fun with this. Yeah, we did. I think it was fun because we were both trying it out for the first time. Yeah. And and it was, it was useful. We looked at a couple of things as far as the distance between you and the lights. The, basically, you really want to separate your subject, who's going to be the silhouette, from the light because you're going to get a little bit of uh, splashback on your subject yeah. if you're too close to the background. And again, that was one of the problems we had, I think, with you know just doing this in our living room. Yeah, our space gave us some limitations. Well, we got, we got some shots where you were just pretty much straight silhouette, and we mm-hmm. had a few that maybe put a little bit of a color gel on your abs. And and I kind of liked some of those shots, though. Yeah, having a little bit of light, or even what looked like a soft rim light, uh, yeah. that worked. So this is really going to depend upon your own creativity and what you want to do. But we're just kind of sharing our experiences so you can decide what works for you. We've also tried doing some gel lighting specifically on you. Mm-hmm. And I don't think we really had that set up quite right because, again, the space and the size of the flashes that we had. But the other challenge was which colors work together. So the, the purple and the... The cyan, I thought, worked very well. Then we did red and green, you know, kind of like Christmas colors. Yes. I did not like that, that at all. That did not look good at all. It, it, it looked atrocious in my mind. And this is one of the other issues that you run into with uh, doing gels is if they have bleed over between where they meet on your background, you don't necessarily get the colors that you want. It's not like you get a nice fine line. There's going to be some spillover. And if the two gel colors are really at opposite places like green and red are the part in the middle doesn't really look all that attractive that's true yeah so but we we found that uh not so much complementary colors that were apart from each other on the color wheel or what worked for us but rather some that are kind of analogous to each other yeah that seemed to work better and i think it comes back to the blending point i think so too because purple and the light blue or cyan fading into each other it yeah. kind of works. They're kind it of melts. Yeah, they, yeah, they they meld together very nicely. But when we were looking at color combinations, do you find any other pairs that you liked, or did you like some with just one color? I I think I stayed. I tend to stay with the blue and purple colors. I think there was some kind of aqua or a teal that we used. We did, and that was that was nice. I think if I went with the reds, I'd probably go with the reds and something more on the on the pink spectrum i don't know we i think we did try like a red and a pink but again as a background i i didn't it find that really bit, flattering um, no <laughs> 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 well it, it it um 
it kind of put a bit of a, a slightly trashy edge to something that it, should have been it a looked fitness like photo. Amsterdam. <laughs> yeah, I, I was not. Um, those were not photos I had any intention of sharing anywhere. No, those those colors. So I guess you have to think about what's the meaning of the colors, what somebody picks up on. And we didn't think about this in advance. We just said, okay, let's try this color and this color. Yeah. And we moved them in there. And then we saw the result and you get a definite visual impact. But that's the power of color. And it, that color, the color on its own took, I was in the same, you know, the same clothing, doing the same kind of poses and the color changes took it from, oh, that's fitness to, ooh, what do we have here? <laughs> All right, well, let's, Let's talk a little bit about as far as you and the way you're posing. So we were looking for your silhouette and we really wanted to see, you know, the musculature on, on your body. Yeah. So, so you did some were like, you know, the strong arms, but it wasn't just that. It wasn't. I actually picked up a set of dumbbells that are not actually heavy dumbbells for what I, what I use. They just aren't, you know, the weights that I would consider heavy at all. The thing is with, with muscles and if you, if you're photographing somebody in sports and fitness, when you relax, those muscles do not look so big. You pick up a set of weights, you start working them for a minute or two, and then they sort of pump up. And I'd been standing around. So if I wanted muscle photos, I had to pick something up. Not heavy weights, but some of the ways that I had to stand and hold them to pose were not natural angles to be holding those weights. And I actually found it difficult because you try to hold and stay in one position, just move an arm or just move your body to the side, turn your head or something, you know, to get the right shapes. I couldn't see what, what William could see through the lens. And what I realized, my biggest challenge was I was holding weights where I had to, so that my arm wasn't partially obscured because you, you're not seeing anything except the black and white. So you change the shape if you have two parts of your body touching. I I was holding the weights with my one hand in a position that had to be extended in a strange way. It just, the little bones and, and muscles in my wrists were not sufficient to hold that for a long period of time. This is one of the problems that we came up with silhouette portraits that you wouldn't even think about in a traditional portrait where you're lighting the subject because you can see the fingers and the arm and, and where everything comes and goes. So in a regular portrait, you put your hand on your hip. You know it's a hand on your hip. You do this in a silhouette. Well, it looks like your wrist is just lumping into your waist or something along those lines. And you need a certain amount of separation. You're going at a very graphic kind of design with that silhouette. Yeah. And that's exactly what you were talking about. If you had a dumbbell in one hand, you're holding up with making a little muscle. The other one was kind of behind you, almost opposite it, you know, with your raising your arm and elbow up with the weight behind you. Yeah. It was very natural for you to let that thing slip in close to your side. But the portrait did not look good with your hand so close to your backside like that. It didn't, but the problem was the way holding it up, I couldn't just extend it by lifting the elbow. I actually had to move the position of my arm out towards the side and then turn my wrist so that we were getting the lines in the picture. And that was, a, I don't know how to explain it. It was a very, very unnatural and awkward way to be holding something in your hand, even if it's not heavy. And I think that's that's what was so difficult. And not everybody who may want to try this is going to be doing it with dumbbells, but something else you have to keep in mind is if you're going to do a profile, you want to get your jawline and your nose just right for yeah. the camera angle. Because again, if your head doesn't look like something recognizable, it you've kind of lost the purpose of the photo. Yeah. I kind of like that one that you had dead on. I think you, it was the one that you shared because initially you cannot tell if I'm facing you or if my back is to you. And I think that works. People recognize the shape of a head. You don't necessarily have to see the face or the nose coming out because it wasn't a profile. It was it was dead on. Yeah. And you could see your shoulder development, your arms. It, it worked very well, I thought. Yeah. And that kind of silhouette will work. But once we started moving you around, whether it was at a 45 degree angle or a right or left profile, then it became much trickier to make sure that everything was recognizable. Yes. Do you remember years ago when I, Apple had iPod commercials and they had those silhouettes that were dancing? Oh, yes. That kind of came to mind to me. It's like they would move around and they, they weren't doing a still photo. But if you froze that frame someplace, sometimes you might actually get a recognizable image or you know figure. And other times it might not have been so good. Yeah. Movement is a bit more forgiving, I think. Well, exactly. Because like people that. recognize the you know, the body when it's moving around, even if it's just a silhouette. And those were really fun and creative kind of commercials. When you're doing this as a still photographer, you've got to be very particular as far as what silhouette you're creating. 
Yes. All right. So when we were doing this, we wanted to make sure, like I said, we had a very clean background. I'm worried about trying this. We're, we're going to do this again at a gym with uh, someone who's doing a bodybuilding competition. And that that gym does not have a clean background as far as just a one color wall. No, it does and not. And I, I think you've got to be careful where you do this. In some cases, that can work to your advantage to show texture with the color that you're going to put on it. And I've seen things like this on buildings that have kind of like a metal exterior. If you're familiar with the Walt Disney Concert Hall out in Los Angeles or the Lou Ruvo uh, Brain Center in Las Vegas, those have that kind of almost like a corrugated or, you know, a flat metal kind of exterior. It could be very interesting to put some gels and lights on, on a building like that. But if you go someplace like a gym typically just has cinder block walls painted some way and maybe where their logo on it, I don't know if that's going to work or not. We're going to have to experiment. Yeah. And it, it may work because depending upon, let's say they put a logo on the wall, depending on what color that is, you might be able to illuminate that in a different color. That's true. And that might be part of the branding that you do for someone in front of it. I don't know. We'll, we'll experiment and we'll play. I think we really did surprise ourselves with, with the color combinations. Yeah, we did. We, and we didn't know what to expect. But some of the stuff we thought would look really great together didn't work. And some of the stuff just looked like, okay, that will work for a first start was what we loved the most. But we found this, like as I said, we were doing this on the background. I think if we were doing this on you, we could probably get away with some more contrasting colors. Yes. So, for example, you've probably seen uh, gelled portraits where there's maybe an orange or warm color on the rim light in the background and then maybe a cooler color on the subject's front. That kind of stuff can work on the model. It does not seem to play well at all on the background. It just doesn't mix nicely. No. We we found that you could get a... Certainly one color was nice, and then it, I don't think it matters that much. A red background could work very well against... And I've, I've got a photo I remember I, I took in Cuba at, a, at the Tropicana show, and there was a moment there where the dancer was in silhouette and the background was red because there was so much smoke and haze, you know, from the stage show. And I really love that moment. It's a nice silhouette on a solid red background, you know, from the haze. And the color, I think, doesn't matter as much. You can get away with any single color on a background. But when you start blending them, then you want colors that are closer to each other on the color wheel rather than on opposite sides. Yes. All right, we tried one other thing, and we had a can of atmosphere aerosol. <laughs> do you remember that? I do. I just I, I was I don't know anything about it. Still don't because I never asked you, and I didn't yeah. understand how it works. Yeah, it's basically it's a uh, haze in a can. So instead of getting a fog machine or a little hazer or something like that to put some atmosphere in your environment, you just spray this around there, and then you can see light beams kind of coming through. And it is an interesting product. Yeah, I don't think it really worked for this because our lights were headed towards the background. And when I sprayed it there, we didn't really get that much of a visual kind of benefit out of having that haze on the background. Now, if we'd had light coming on you and the haze was behind you, I think that might have worked rather interestingly well. But if you're shooting at the background, don't try to haze it up. It doesn't seem to benefit you at all. Okay. That didn't hurt. Didn't hurt anything. But, you know, it was also a waste of a few sprays out of the can. I'll see if I can put a link to that on there. I, I'm, I got it off of Amazon, so it's really not that hard to find. And that was kind of our, our concept. We really wanted to show the definition of your body, but it was, I think it was a fun shoot. We were experimenting with something we hadn't done before. You want to give yourself plenty of space. You want to make sure that you separate your subject from the lights in the background. And then you want to choose colors that work together if, if you're going to do dual colors. I wouldn't do more than two colors. No, I think that's just going to get too too busy. And also, like we saw with the blending, it, it can get a bit complex. Well, it, it gets a bit complex. And also, depending upon the room that you have, if you cannot move one light to the same distance as the light on the opposite side, then it doesn't cover as much. We noticed that uh, sometimes when we had like maybe the purple or lavender gel, it didn't go as high up as the other one did because we simply didn't have enough room to pull it all mm -hmm. the way back. I think you want to make sure that you've got an equal amount of space on either side of your background to put your lights there. Oh, and one other thing, if you're going to do this for, a, you know, a light behind your subject, maybe you're not going to do full length like we did and you're going to do like three quarter or, or waist high, that's fine. And you want to get a light stand that's not going to stick up too much. It's actually, I, I looked at a lot of my light stands and I thought most of these are going up too high. 
And what I could end up doing, we didn't on this one, but I've got a little platypod. If you've ever seen those, it's basically a little plate that goes on the ground and it has a little um, light stand nub, you know, the bolt that you put your lights on. So you could have that on the ground and shoot up, or you can also find smaller light stands that don't go too high off the ground. But if you've just got regular light stands, I think those stick up a little bit too high. Yeah, we wouldn't get lowered. We just couldn't bring them down anymore. Yeah, so that's why we ended up going off the side. If you're lucky and you can mount stands maybe above somehow, like get a C stand Mm -hmm. going over. But uh, we we didn't do that. We just kind of... uh, this was some fun at the end of yeah. taking some photos. Well, we'd already done. This was fun after the, we'd done yeah. our real photo shoot. We'd set up our lights, kind of doing some product and marketing photos. And that was the business of it. And then we figured, all right, so long as we got this set up, let's have some fun with some gels. Yeah. So that's all we wanted to share with you today. We hope that this has been helpful for you. Maybe give you an idea to try something else out. And keep in mind, your subject doesn't have to be a person. If you're not into portrait photography, this might be fun to try with you know, any number of things. I don't know if it will work with a cup of coffee. You could set up a still life. You could set up some shapes and play with some shapes and do some abstract kind of things if that's what you're into. You know what? I it's, it's really, it's just a silhouette. As long as it's recognizable and people look at it and they're intrigued by it, it says something. So I think it's worth a shot. Thank you so much for joining us on the Photo Flunky Show. As always, we appreciate you, and we would love it if you would subscribe to the Photo Flunky Show. If you're on your mobile device, go ahead and hit the button now. You can subscribe, or you can go to williambeam.com slash iTunes. The show notes are going to be available at williambeam.com slash episode 138, and there are links to subscribe there as well. Thank you very much for listening. We'll see you again next week.